feels like it took forever to get here, but uh, here we are. So today, what are we going to talk about? The Torinox Farmer. Let's check it out. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Bushcraft North of 60. I'm your host, Aaron. My uh, associate host, Barbara, she's not out for this one, but keep eye out for her in upcoming episodes now, too. That It's getting a little nicer out, snow's gone. She's probably a little more likely to get out and hang out with us here. So today, we're talking about this Victorinox Farmer Swiss Army Knife. Uh, my first Alox knife was actually just one prior to this. I ended up doing a trade on a really cool Facebook site you should get on. It's called uh, Swiss Army Knife Collectors. It's like the biggest Swiss Army Knife uh, Facebook group out there. And there's people buying, selling, and trading, and just wealth of knowledge on there. And people that appreciate the hobby. So users, collectors, everything in between. So... The first Alox knife I had, because I traditionally would have just had 84mm and 91mm Celador knives, which if you don't know what a Celador scale is, that's this red plastic that you traditionally would think of when you see a Swiss Army knife. So that's their uh, proprietary name for their plastic blend, a Celador. The first Alox scaled one I had, which is this aluminum scaled versions, was actually a 2003 Soldier knife, so that would have been the old Soldier produced I think from 1962 to 2008. It's on a 93 millimeter platform which is how long uh, this one is as well. And the Soldier, if I am correct, it was originally based off the uh, Pioneer or Sturdy Boy which this also shares uh, the chassis with. So your traditional sort of Soldier Pioneer knife would be like this and as far as it has. This is your cap lifter for bottle caps and screwdriver and wire bender stripper has a 90 degree stop so you can really get some torque on things with it which is nice uh, you can use it like a light pry bar but keep in mind the limitations of the knife so i wouldn't go trying to shoehorn a motor in and jimmy the transmission up to it with it unless you really had to but uh, just for light prying tasks i know my huntsman which has a similar tool but not quite as robust on it just because it's a little smaller I had to use that to get into a cabin that we were staying in moose hunting. The door was frozen shut, so I had to jimmy the screen on the window open, and jimmy the window open, and crawl in, get the door open from the inside, and then we got to spend a couple of days there moose hunting. So you've got this, and it's funny. If you look at what is called the wire stripper, there is no edge on that whatsoever. So how do you strip wires with it? Bring it into its 90-degree stop. Bring your blade up pass your wire through it and have it stuck in the notch, bring the blade down, and as the blade's on the insulation, give your knife a couple of turns till you get through the insulation, then you've got your wire sticking out, grab it into your notch, bend it over, pull it off, comes right off. And that, so I used to carry a, a plier-based multi-tool for the longest time, Leatherman, a couple of them actually, and when I decided to go to Swiss Army Knives exclusively, it was interesting without pliers how much your imagination can find ways to use this to grab onto things, pick things up, bend them, pry them. These things will make you smarter. It's much better than uh, all of those. Well, maybe they would be good for memory, I guess, if I could remember what they're called. Like brain teaser. Anyway, so you want to be a genius, get a Swiss Army knife. So that's half the opening layer. The other tool in the opening layer is this awesome Victorinox can opener. So. If uh, you guys were at the bottom of the can, you would basically work your way around in that sort of fashion. It'll ring a can in no time. You also have this screwdriver tip on it, which will do not only flat screws or slotted screws, we want to call them that. It'll do at least number two Phillips. I've used these like quite a bit, even adjusting derailers on bikes when I was still a bicycle mechanic. That's your opening layer. And these tools are going to be a little thicker, and especially the bottle cap lifter, a little longer than your 84 and 93, or sorry, 91, this is 93 millimeter ones. You've got this awesome, awesome reamer all punch. So there's no sewing eye on this, but the nice thing, there's no backside tools on uh, the Alox 93 millimeter lineup. So normally we'd have that reamer all on the officer's knives. This one's on the end, it's in line, which is awesome you would not believe just how useful this tool is so as far as bushcraft uses go for drilling holes obviously uh, you can even use this like a small plane so if you keep your edge level to your workpiece and draw it towards you like this it's just like a small hand plane it's great for notches and small projects uh, you can sew with it so there's no sewing eye if you guys look on the end of it you'll see that it's punched with a little lip 
going up this way, that creates a hollow here. So in a real pinch, you can push this through material, and while it's in there, normally whatever it's in will kind of lift up a little opening there, and you can pass it in, or obviously if you pull this back out, depending how thick it is and how sturdy it is, you may or may not want to keep that in there. It's supposed to be really good on a ferro rod. I don't like using ferro rods on sharpened edges because I kind of feel if it can make that kind of heat, you might be taking the temper out of a tiny little spot here and there, but that's just me. You've got the 93 millimeter, and I'm not saying the blade measures 93, but for the 93 millimeter knife, you've got the main and only knife blade for that. It's a spear point blade, which is nice. It's flat ground, which is your typical Victorian box with your little bevel down here. I don't know what they usually come at, probably 25 degrees or something like that. Somebody will correct me out there. But that is a great knife for food prep, for carving, just for general pocket knife duties. I will say Swiss Army knives, they don't replace the right tools, but they're the right tool to have if you have nothing else. we will put it that way. So the thing that differentiates this from a soldier, or a pioneer, which is basically the uh, civilian version of the soldier, is this knife, or saw blade, sorry, it's not a knife blade. Um, as far as I can tell, it's the same length and same blade, pretty much as what's on my 91mm Huntsman. It's got a really sharp spine on it. So if you were producing some tinder from scraping off bark or things like that, or fine materials, you can get that out of it. That saw blade, that is one sharp, hungry saw blade. You want to see that in the stuff, and we will here in a bit. And I've seen a lot of people use these on their ferro rods, so we might try that today. We'll see. I find it hard to do that to something that still looks nice. So that's the tool set. You've got this key ring which in this case I've swapped out the one it came with for one off a 58mm Swiss Army knife just because it's smaller. And the little piece of metal on the liner here that that attaches to was pretty sharp on the edges. I don't know if you'll see it or not, but I ended up taking my Lansky sharpening set a couple of the stones and chamfering those edges. And on the civilian ones like the Pioneer and this Farmer, you've got this engraving panel in the back. I might even go and get Bushcraft North of 60 put on there. I don't know. We'll see. I kind of like the thought of that, I'm kind of making my own. So that's the farmer, enough gabbing about it. Let's get out and try it out on some bushcraft tasks. Alright guys, so the first task for this, I want to get a little brew going. I want to have a little cup of tea, and I've got some char cloth to make too, so I'm going to need a little bit of this stuff. And yeah, I mean, you can break the small stuff pretty easy and make a little pile of it for your stick stove. But... Even for some thicker stuff like this. Now this is uh, jack pine. You're not breaking thick jack pine with your bare hands. And it's also quite dense. So let's just see what this can do here. And you don't need to saw all the way through. You see people doing that all the time. You're just burning it, right? So saw until it's almost all the way through and just snap it off, and that can go for, uh, you know, even more stuff, so I've seen people try to hold these, and it gets a little out of hand and stuff. Just jam it up against something else here. Yeah. As long as your something else doesn't let go on you here. A rock might have been a better idea. Let's use a rock. All right. Doesn't need to go through all the way. Move up. Start another notch. And then it's almost like a little one of those wood puzzles when you're a kid. You can make little planes and trains and things. And it's just gonna break right where you cut it. It's gonna save you some time. stuff out of the way into this thick stuff again. So that's the saw blades cutting. Well, just for giggles, I'll see how long it takes to cut through this all the way. I'm not rushing or anything. I see all these guys doing cutting racing, it seems like. I mean, you don't need to go 100 miles an hour. You're going to burn energy without cutting wood. But look at that. That would be, let's see, uh, not quite one-third the width of the blade, but it cut through that pretty quick. That's a smooth cut. Wouldn't call
call it a pruning bleed, but I wouldn't call it far from it. And let's just check something here. Now, if that was a bark that was flammable, more flammable than this, I should say, like if you were doing uh, juniper or something, yeah. Well, I'm going to finish cutting this up, and then we'll try something else with it. All right, so our stick stove's loaded up, ready to go. So, let's see. It's just using what I have in my pocket, so I'm not even going to go get any sort of fancy ferro rod like I normally have in my pack. Just what I carry on my person, because if I know I've got this on me, then chances are good I've got that on me, unless something bad has happened to my pants. So, what I'm going to do try something. I'm going to take the knife blade here. I'm going to try to get some more edges here. Just for the spark to catch on. I don't want to go all the way across it and cut it in half. If I can help it. Yeah, you can use your knife blade and stuff easy enough too. This part here is going to be a little harder. I also want to go there we go. See? See all those little edges now? That's what I'm going to try to get a spark to lay on. Put that piece in here. Try to do that without cutting myself. So this is going to be like a fuse, hopefully. And all that stuff opened up. Yeah, let's just see. Yeah, that'll, that'll do some stuff. Let's put this down underneath so it doesn't get caught. First time using the ferro rod on this. And there we go. One stick stove fire coming right up. We've got a boil. It's only 500 milliliters of water, but I'd say it took maybe three to four minutes. So we'll make our brew out of that. I'm going to chuck some bigger wood in here. Because we're going to do something else now. Still need some small stuff to keep the home fires going there, but we'll get some bigger things in here. This thing burns hot, but it burns fast. So you definitely this little stove. If you want to see how I made this, I've got the uh, the video on YouTube. I think it's called Hobo Can uh, or Coffee Can Hobo Stove. I'll take a look when I get home and put it in the description at the bottom. Just for you guys. Well, that should be long enough. Air cloth going.
seen it process a little bit of firewood. I just want to show you guys something. So, I mean, this is just a little scrap piece of branch here. But, as far as notching goes, let's see. I wanted to notch a couple of these pieces together. So, I don't know if you guys can see or not there. So, you got two pieces of wood, and say I was making like a trap or something like that. What I will do, I'm going to do one cut here first, just to, uh, you know what, we'll even use this side that I did earlier just for an example. And we're going to cut another notch on here, and fit that together, and see how that works. Let's go halfway. Seems like this kind of green uh, birch is clogging up a little bit. There's halfway. Now let's lay this across. So I'm going to line it up so I've got one line there. And all I'm going to do is just score it and cut it. And we'll knock that chip out of there in a minute. And just light pressure going slow start, and it'll keep it from jumping around on you. Man, I smell fox. Could be a den over there in the rocks. So, another important thing, don't, if it starts to jam up, don't let your saw twist side to side, or you could bend and break it. So, see that little notch in there? couple things here. First we're going to take the blade and what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to hold it in this hand but I'm going to use this thumb to force the blade through it. I'm going to be careful not to keep this hand stationary and push with this thumb because then it's going to want to close the blade up. So I'm going to go across on that side. I didn't leave myself much room to work here, did I? But you should be able to leverage that off your thumb. So, you could spend quite a bit of time going back and forth and back and forth, or once you get that one out, because you're not going to want to use your, your blade to actually chip things too much, you can either get in here with this guy, start lifting that up, or Actually, a fantastic little tool. Yeah. Could even save that bark for something if you needed it to. Yeah, you can go in layers like this. Just till things start to get close to the end. That's all cut, so that should come out all right. That's one way, or just go back to the blade. Whatever works better for you and the piece you're working on. I'm going to say, in this case, just to get her hogged out, as long as you don't try to take that whole piece out at once. So it's not like a sheath knife. You're not going to jam that in there and twist it off. And it's also not as wide a spine as a sheath knife, so you're going to find a little more pressure on your thumb. It's going to be a little more noticeable, but we almost got her. Dry wood, this would probably pop out a little easier as well. Hmm. Keep hearing things over there. So... You've got this notch cleaned out. It's kind of down to the saw blade marks. Use the saw blade kerf here to uh, clean our notch out right to that.
another cool thing about that reamer. So if you look at the way that blade is beveled, you can even ride this almost like a like a plane. So once you get that edge to where it's going to start cleaning off the high spots, then you can really have a nice notch cleaned out there. Although I did a pretty good job with the blade apparently. It's not catching too much. Should do a crookedy. So, one notch, and another notch. Now if you were to bind that up, if you're making a steady joint, the other thing you can do now, let's see if we can do this. Let's take our reamer. Now we're gonna start a hole in the middle here. This thing just goes through like nobody's business. Pretty fantastic tool. And you guys can see that's just really chunking that up. And out it comes on the other side. Now what I'm going to do, I've got this cut. I'm going to come in from this side as well so that my whole even though it might be hourglass shaped to some degree, it's not going to be quite as tapered. So you see that hole? Now what I'm going to do is lay this on top of here, come through that piece of wood again, until I get a hole started. something to work with here now. Now let's go through this. I'm really hoping this is in focus. There we are coming out the back side again. We're going to come in over here just to kind of square things up. This is a great tool. This thing has so many uses, this reamer. So, I've got a hole through both of those. We're going to fit this together. And, we're going to get a plug. This I just found off the ground. Probably not the nicest thing to do to your knife. Oh, look what I found. Don't need hammer. Perfect. I'm going to hold these, but I'm going to make sure I don't blast myself with that peg in there. Oh. Green stick would probably be better. Let's try that again with a green stick. Okay, so we've got our two holes. Got that old piece of dried up wood mostly out of there. We'll make a peg out of this. So, we've got one piece clean out that last little bit here, put that out of there, and so this one, I haven't really cleaned out down yet, but just to show you how well this works, see how that's taking that right down to nice flat wood, and the same thing on this side, as long as you get your angle right, look at that, and this one is quite easy to sharpen too, where it is just one straight bevel, if you know what you're doing, so, We've got a piece of green wood here that isn't going to snap on us. And let's clean that up. Look for a straight-ish section without too many knots. I like these Victorinox blades. I think my sheath knife, I might even switch to a flat grind spear point pretty soon. I think that's pretty close to what Kephart describes as well. It is quite the slicer. So, it looks like we've got a good straight stretch here, so I'm just going to clean the bark off of this, which is pretty easy when it's nice and sharp. And not only is this nice and sharp, but it's nice to keep sharp. So, I've got a Lansky uh, 
professional sharpening system. I hardly ever have to use it on my Victorinox knives. I find I set the edge once, and if I just strop it and look after it, things aren't too bad. If you abuse it, you might have to do it more often. So, doesn't quite fit yet. So I'm going to do is take just a little bit of this off. Not too much. Just keep in mind that this is going to shrink as it dries up. Depends how long you need this to hold up for you and what you're building. So, and if you have a tighter hole, put the tighter hole on the back side. There we go. There's a few things we can do here. I'm going to show you a couple tricks. So, first thing I'm going to do is take my saw blade. And we're going to cut this probably boat up here because I want a flat edge. And you'll see why in a minute. And you see that flat edge? And we're going to take our Stone Age hammer and we're going to drive this in. And it's really starting to tighten up and wedge on us there. So that's feeling pretty good. See how much I've got sticking up there? I'm going to cut the same thing off down here. And you can use a regular knife blade on this too, but the saw blade on this farmer is great for this. So, I wonder if a fella can saw backwards. Maybe if I switch hands. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to move the piece instead of the saw blade. There we go. So we've got two flat ends, right? Let's keep most of that saw over the knife. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that stick that I uh, cut that dowel out of. And what I'm going to do is just make a really thin little strip. Just about like that, I guess. But I want it to be kind of flat across. Like that. Maybe a little thinner. I'll just do some finer carving here. And then I'm going to take this and I'm going to carefully split that with the saw, or sorry, the knife blade. And what you can do is put the point halfway through it carefully. Hold on to the knife because the knife's going to want to come out and jam that in. And now we've got one wedge here. And ideally, if you make that wedge a little thinner than your uh, than your dowel, it can go down inside. Now I'm just going to score this wedge, almost like when you're putting shims in a window frame. I'll see why in a second. Don't cut the tip of your finger off. That would be embarrassing. And I'm just going to give that another little score here. It's green, so it's still pretty resilient. So we've got a wedge there. And we're going to just take our same piece of wood. And we'll just go back a little further. Do the same thing. I'm going to narrow it this time. Kind of like if you were hanging an axe head. There's a lot of power in wedges. Yeah, these are great little blades for stuff like this. Alright. And we're going to split this again. You know what? You could go either in the same direction or a different direction. I feel like I'm going to go in a little bit different direction. Don't ask me why. Alright. You know what else?
else I'm going to do, I'm going to put the handle in line with the wood so I can hang on to the two of them. Just like that. This will be a lot easier setting down. Jam that in. And just take my blade out. Push it in until it's all the way home. You could even use the saw probably on this if you were careful. It's just I got a funny feeling it might end up taking this piece of wood out of here. So if you don't have cordage, there's no reason not to have a joint. Yeah, it's a little springy. I mean, you can still bind that or whatnot, but if you just had some little fun project on the go that wasn't under a lot of sort of heavy use and stress, there you go. The Victorinox Farmer. Swiss Army knife. Let's see what else we can do with it. Why not do a quick little dirty carving here? An old piece of birch. Let's see what we can make out of this. takes off quite a bit of wood if you need it to. I remember with a folding knife, I mean there's a chance that blade could come back, and I say almost any time, but uh, keep the pressure cutting so that it wants to push that blade back to where it's supposed to be and not where it camps out when it's not supposed to be. Side. It's not going to be the prettiest thing I ever carved, I don't think. I took that knot off pretty good. So like I said, this has a little heavier blade than you'll find on your 84mm and your 91mm officer's knives. Another cool thing, so some of you guys might be in the habit of pushing on your knife with your thumb on the blade. You don't want to do that on a folding knife. But it's a good way to break the habit. I mean, there's times it's good to do that, too. But... And with the belly of the blade, we can actually slice a little bit. Without the blade having to uh, work through the wood, you can take that piece out and then continue push cutting through it. Just like that. So do a little slice and then push it off. Not again. Now, I'm not getting too bad of a hot spot. I've heard some people complain about the keyring, but I don't know if that really applies with the blade as much as it does with the awl. Shape this a little bit more. It is good and sharp. you have a bit of a square blank, kind of. If you have a hard time getting symmet symmetrical like balance on your stuff, hold it up to the sky, especially if it's light. And rather than seeing all these little imperfections in green, you'll just get the silhouette of it. A little handy trick I was taught by somebody on YouTube I wish I could remember. Uh, I think it might have been Dave Canterbury at the uh, Pathfinder School. So what are we going to make? We just cut through the pith, which hopefully isn't going to give us too many problems. So you can see what I'm doing to the tip there. This used to be a painstaking process with just a blade. You'll see why. Never cut to work.
towards your thumb unless you need to. But be careful. going down in here. And, yep. Bringing that up. Just to get a little bit of a hollow there. Another cool thing, if you wanted to uh, bring it towards yourself like that, but you can still slip, especially if you've got green or wet wood, but sometimes I like to put my thumb on top of the blade. Just draw it like that, and you can shave off thinner than tissue paper thickness of wood this way. You got really good control over your angle, of your edge. So this is going to have to be a quick one. It's not going to be my prettiest one, but just for demonstration purposes. And be super careful. I mean, your wrist is right here. That's kind of you don't want to cut that. I keep both hands together and just rotate this hand on this hand. I'm not pulling on it or anything that can slip. All it's going to do is maybe move an inch or two. And the piece is still between me and my wrist, but uh, do so at your own risk. Don't take any of this as actual advice. Let's see how we start to carve back into that now. And I'm not pulling on it or anything that can slip. All it's going to do is maybe move an inch or two. And the piece is still between me and my wrist, but uh, do so at your own risk. Don't take any of this as actual advice. Let's see how we start to carve back into that now. And then we get this thicker piece. Just slice him right off. All right, so there's that. That's the blade work for now. Take our saw blade, and I'm going to come in. And this is just a variation of the plumber's vise I like to use. Let's come into, let's say, right about there. Nice easy cuts to start. Make sure I don't go too deep here. A couple more. Yeah, about the, the deepness of the width of the spine. your leg muscles if you need to keep this a little tighter. See, I get those coming through. And what a fella could even do is intersect those there and there, but we can always do that later. I'm going to do something similar up here. And I might even do that other technique that we did earlier, just moving the workpiece and not the saw. So just lay it on it, watch your knuckles. And I'm going to come pretty deep into it, but not all the way yet. I want a handle while I'm working on it to hang on to. So, uh, about that much, maybe a little bit more. Never hurt anybody. There we go. It's not wiggly, but it's not on there super strong. So we've got that. Now, we're going to take this reamer tool. And, let's see, so... What I'm making is a fork, and it's going to be three-tined. You can even use this like a scribe to mark your, your lines you're going to cut. So I'm doing three equal width tines. Where those tines come down, I'm going to drill a hole at the bottom of each one. So when I used to use just a saw or a knife blade to do this, I'd go back and forth and back and forth, scoring with the knife till it cut through all the way. But the way 
you see this? This is the bee's knees, I must say. I want to go till it just comes out the back. Because I have a plan. It may or may not be a good plan, but I have a plan. There we go. See that? We're going to do the same thing we did with that joint. I'm going to come on the back side here just to kind of even up, and you can hear that cutting across the fiber. Is that ever something else? I mean, you could use this even to repair a, uh, a canoe if you had to, to sew it up with, say, uh, say we're going to split some spruce root. If you tore your canoe up, even something of uh, the newer materials, put a bunch of holes on each side of it, stitch it up while it's wet, let it dry out, and then uh, gum it all with some spruce pitch. Yeah, that will get you on your way quicker than walking. Try not to jab yourself in the leg. That's discomforting. And you can clean out the hole periodically, but I don't think it's crucial. So there we are in the back. The more you do this, the more accurate you'll get with your reamer too. I'm not gonna say I'm super good at it yet, but I'm trying. So basically what these are is uh, terminal points for your next cut, which I'm going to go back to the saw, and I am going to carefully line that up, and since we're cutting with the grain, it may not go as well. Just take your time. Let it bite in on an angle until it gets in deep enough to come right across it. Material, the longer that's going to take. But we get all day here and the sun's out, so we'll enjoy it. Now you know why I left uh, the handle on it, huh? Let's try the old plumber's vice oh, yeah. You want to be careful you don't twist your blade for two reasons now. You don't want to break it, but you also don't want to split out your fork. So once I get those down all the way, I'll come back and show you the rest of it. So we've got up to our uh, our drilling points here with the saw. So now what I'm going to do is go back to my blade, and I'm going to just keep slicing out little slivers off of here, same as you would do with a regular sort of uh, technique. It's just a little easier coming into that with the saw blade first, I think. Especially a nice sharp saw like this has. I'm going to widen this side out. And the idea is going to be to uh, taper these all to a point. All it takes is time. My stomach is starting to make some noise too. I keep thinking there's a bear around here. It's just me getting hungry. So someone who's phenomenal with a Swiss Army knife, Felix Immler, I believe his name is. I'm pretty sure he's actually even Swiss himself, which 
would make sense. You should see what that man does with a pocket knife. He's written some books too. I haven't picked them up yet, but I think I might make a point of getting those just because it would be nice. I mean, the nice thing about bushcraft, you can get a book and follow this and that or somebody's video that, and I'm no professional in any of this by any means, so be warned. It's going to require a certain amount of your own brain. But you can start with other people's ideas and techniques and carving and things like that. And the more techniques that you develop yourself, it's almost like having more tools in your kit or more tools in your knife, I guess. Things that uh, you wouldn't have thought about before kind of open up right before your very eyes. Which is cool. And you'll probably hear the seagulls are back. That is not my favorite animal. I will warn you guys, you'll probably find this relaxing and habit forming. And since I'm here just whittling this stuff, I'm going to talk about what I think this is actually for and what a person should use it for and why they should have it. So will this replace a sheath knife and a saw and maybe a few other tools? Not really 100%. If you found yourself somewhere with only this in your pocket, I wouldn't say you were down and out by any means, that's for sure. You can definitely get by with it. Or uh, just to keep on your person all the time. And say you're just out with friends and they're like, hey, let's go for a walk somewhere. And you find a piece of wood, you're, you're good to go. On top of your regular task that any pocket knife should be able to do for you every day. But sometimes it's nice just to have something small for finer tasks. I mean, your bushcraft knife is going to be your, your go-to probably. But if you watch much of Dave Canterbury, traditionally, at least with Americans, a lot of their carving would have been done with their pocket knife and their big knife would have been for heavier tasks and for dressing out game and stuff. So if you want to really kick it old school, you might find that a pocket knife is a little more traditional. I mean, there's stories of guys carving gun stocks with them. If they fell down and broke their gun stock on a hunt and they're back at camp, they'll actually, uh, there's stories about them whittling down gun stocks. So what I'm doing here, I'm just flexing my hand and when it gets tight it's pushing the blade tip up. Um, for meat, so anything with feathers and fur this is going to work pretty good on. I wouldn't want to take apart a whole moose or something with it and keep in mind if you do dress an animal out you're going to want to clean it before you do some food prepping with it that's just common sense. Especially things like uh, rabbits or something that you might get sick from until it's cooked. But, yeah, to have in your pocket just in case. I mean, most people would carry a dedicated hunting knife probably. But once again, if this is all you find yourself with, you're by no means at a disadvantage. I'm going to thin these tines out a bit more here. That thumb pushing the, uh, the edge through things. Because I don't need it super thick. I could have thinned out this a little bit, but you know what? It's a lot easier to thin little tines than the whole thing of wood there. Uh, this is definitely something that you can enjoy in the bush but in your pocket every day too. I use this quite a bit, even the uh, the reamer tool. I bought some uh, headphones yesterday for shooting that not only do they provide 23 decibels of hearing protection, but they also have a little microphone on each side and a speaker so I can still hear when I'm out in the woods. But then when I pull the trigger, I don't have my uh, ears ringing. Well, and they kind of ring all the time now, which is my own fault, I guess. But uh, yeah. Don't have to worry about that anymore. So we've got our tines, just a couple little things here. I was going somewhere with that. The reamer tool. So blister packaging, that reamer tool is fantastic for that. Now, let us see how we want to go about this now. I'm just going to clean out 
just that little bit of fiber here. I mean, it's okay to start your day with fiber, but this is where it ends. No more. Saw blade again. And I'll separate this guy off. Get all that stuff cleaned out of the kerf. Oh, it's another thing too. So these are actually a tapered uh, saw blade. They're thicker at the teeth than they are at the spine. So as it cuts through, it's actually cutting a wider kerf than the than the blade itself is. So you're not going to jam off as easily. short but I just wanted to do something quick here. Now what we can do and what I'm gonna use is my wool coat just because that should A stop anything from coming down there too bad and B it should also give me something to work against. It's not gonna hurt my foot or my leg. So what I'm going to do, normally I would say not to baton a slip joint, but this is a really small piece of wood. I'm going to hold it so if the blade does close, it's not going to jab into me. It doesn't need to be much. So we got her locked again here. I'm going to take that right up to that little cut. One side, and then you can always uh, pare this down just to get it to your, your mark here. And we'll go to the other side. We're going to have this not quite closed, not quite open. reason I'm going, so the blade tapers this way, it's thicker back here, that's going to lift off that wood sooner, hopefully. And I'm going to carefully open that up again. And I'm just going to lift that piece off. down. If you wanted to get really fancy, you could even cut some lines in here and whatnot, but we're not going to get too crazy today. I'm just going to round off this handle a tiny bit. This is what I like to call it quick and dirty. If you should have brought a fork and you didn't, Make a fork quick and dirty. Now on these corners where those little feather sticks are sticking up, just get your blade down in there and separate those fibers. dental plan, then you might want to round these guys off. There you go. One super quick fork. So for one small tool, you can do quite a bit of work with it, considering. I guess it's time to get something to eat now. Now we have our fork. We'll get our stick stove all set up here. If you're used to using a knife, 
you're going to find the angle is a little different on this. Guys, it's been about three minutes at the most, and we've got a really healthy boil there. So, get this ready to go. That. And we're going to take our water off of here again. Make sure it's definitely hot. And hopefully, put that somewhere remotely safe. I want that coming downhill towards me. No, sir. stuff back in where it's supposed to go. Okay, another three minutes, we'll be ready to dish up. It starts boiling again pretty quick. And we'll put in our, our oil and our flavor. This is your traditional bushcraft meal, apparently. Well, I would say that that is done. home with me. I'm not going to burn up my stove and make a mess in it. A little bit of whatever this mystery sauce is. Stir it up like it's going to be a fantastic feast here. A little fork that we made. I'm sure that's good enough for government work. Let's see here. It was mostly uh, pine pitch that cooked this more than the wood itself. Hope that cools off. Oh, Father, we thank you for this food in Jesus' name. Thank you for this beautiful day. Amen. Mm. Now that, that is what I'm talking about. All right, folks. Well, I guess that floats. So that is the Victorinox Swiss Army Knife Farmer Model. Quick and dirty review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Maybe get one and try it for yourself. And get out there in the bush and have a good time. So until then, we'll see you next time from the Northwest Territories here in Northern Canada. You guys take care.